you, Peter. We now move on to Dr. Michelle and Santa. Thank you, Ive. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I've been a little bit hot. <laughs> um, the wine, <laughs> the heat. Um, yeah, I. I don't even know where to begin. Um, I have done a PhD on a practice called Kumpfer, Guyanese Kumpfer. Has anyone heard of Kumpfer? It's, um, it's, it's kind of underground, yeah, but it's a traditional practice where um, spirits manifest. Yeah, and you hear the beating of the drums and, and, and you will go into a state of trance. Those who are present, it can take anyone at any time. Um, and I was interested in this practice I wanted to investigate what actually happens when people go into the state of trance. Um, so I organised to do a PhD at the University, London Metropolitan University, where I met Clem C. Turan, who's not here, cricket, everybody knows Clem, most people know Clem C. Turan. Yes. Um, so he was there and they actually uh, sponsored my PhD. As part, I wanted to show that we have these traditional practices, these spiritual and cultural practices that are, have been um, discredited through the colonial process. And I wanted to reclaim them. And so I wanted to show how they can operate in literature. So as part of the PhD, I wrote a novella. And that novella is, is themed and it's based on the practice of comfort. That, that, that book will be coming out two months' time, a month's time or so, and I will let you know about the launch, but you can take one of these flyers, which is next door. So this is the book on comfort, um, and this book, which is called Something Buried in the Yard. Comfort is actually going to be published by a publishing company that I set up in 2014, and jointly with the privilege of the Bogle Overture, of which I'm part of now, as in trying to uh, make sure that that company, as one of the first um, black owned publishing company in this in the UK um, remains. And so I wanted to show then, I wanted to extract the novella, so you can read the, the book, which is theoretical, and the novella in here. Um, but the novella is actually also separated out in this format called Something Buried in the Yard. And the Something Buried in the Yard is literally something buried, who knows that phrase? Something Buried in the Yard. Yeah. So, um, so there's that. And what happened was this novella is the, the spirits, our ancestral spirits, are the narrators of the story. Yeah, so it's written in a way that takes you out of your comfort zone of reading. It's actually what they call experimental fiction, I believe. I don't put it in these terms, but they would. Um, and so, but the problem was I, I did this, and it was one of those cases where this would be one of those where it's difficult for publishers to appreciate the form and so on. So um, I, at the same time, was intrigued or concerned by some problems that my nephew was experiencing. And I imagined that if his mother were to maybe send him back home, um, he might find some way to resolve some of these issues, or at least he would be on some kind of journey of understanding the complexity of his own identity and the identity of his ancestry. And so I end up writing this book, um, Elijah. Now, in this room, <laughs> there are no, I, I can't see a young adult necessarily in here, but maybe you, or maybe you're just deceiving us. <laughs> yeah. um, but really, like, it's, it's a 15-year-old boy who goes on a particular journey. He gets into trouble, serious trouble that's actually impacting young people right now, still. This time, is, this was set in 2008 at a time when my nephew was experiencing some real, real issues, getting in gang cultures and so on. And I think that's why it deters people when they read, when they think of it that way. But actually, this is really about a journey of self-investigation that the young boy has to go through. And um, so he, there's three parts of it. He goes, he's, he, he's involved in a murder that's right at the beginning, or he's there at a murder. We know about this joint enterprise thing. His mother decides that she she kind of has an inkling that maybe he was part of it, she doesn't know. She decides to ship him home um, to Guyana and kind of abandons him there. Leaves him to deal with whatever his stuff. And he is, begins his search. So in the middle section of this, the part two is where he goes into the interior. He's going on the interior now on the premise that he's looking for his father. His lost father who you never know. And he, he never knew his father. So he goes looking for him. And, um, and then he has to come back to London. 
but he's actually experienced a bit of um, a br brutal experience by his father's who was uh, a father's friend who was um, digging for gold with him. They were partners, so he experiences this this abuse by this. Slowly, he lifted the lid of the seeing eye because he'd obviously been brutalized. A large cat splotched with a compact range of black spots was looking down at him. It looked like a leopard, but was much smaller than those he'd seen on wildlife programs. Though small, it was larger than any cat he had seen and surely large enough to attack him. But because the attack was delayed, if it was even going to come, Eli felt some of his muscles release themselves, felt his breath release too. The cat looked quizzically at him. Its eyes stared intensely into Eli's eye as though it was reading some secret message hidden there. Its caramel-coloured fur was thick on the top with a lighter creamy shade underneath. There were black slashes, not spots, on the front part of his underbelly. His fur seemed so soft that some part of Eli imagined he could stroke it. Maybe if he could move an arm, he might attempt to. Eli wondered why the cat had not attacked him. Wondered what else he wanted from him. He didn't go to the cassava bread nor the cup. It began to back away, but, moved, but only moved about a foot or two from Eli. It stretched out its lean body on the ground, nestling its head against some leaves. The cat slept beside Eli for hours. Eli knew he too had stolen an hour or two of sleep, woken up to find the cat still there looking over at him. Night fell amid this peculiar scene between Eli and the cat. Eli noticed that he felt stronger during the night, that now it seemed possible that he could drag himself closer to the creek and drink some water. Whatever was in the cup must be gone or filthy by now. Could that be worse than the creek's water? He made an attempt to drag himself towards the creek, but his body hurt so much he stopped, releasing a somewhat muffled sound of anguish. He tried again to shift himself. The cat was looking at him as if offering silent encouragement. Light from the stars and the moon radiated the cat's amber eyes. Eli persisted towards the water, despite excruciating pain. When he got close enough to drink it, he saw the cat was moving towards the water also. Eli froze, wondering if the cat had thought him dead before and might strike him now. But why had he not eaten him if that was the case? Perhaps the cat preferred to kill his prey than have one ready made. Eli kept still, but the cat pranced slowly towards the water. When it was beside Eli, it dipped its head into the creek, lashed its large tongue against the coffee brown water and drank. It paused and looked at Eli, who felt compelled to respond to the silent language being communicated between them. He eased himself over the water and dropped his whole head in. The coolness of the water shocked his entire body, awakening new areas of pain. He didn't take in too much, but the water choked him a little. And then it just won't progress. So I just wanted to share that bit. Um, and thank you. I also wrote a collection of poems. I don't call myself a poet, really, truly. Really. Um, but um, this was also because I do creative writing classes. So I, at the time, I didn't really have anything. So I threw together these poems that I've been writing over the years and published them so that my students can know, look, I've published something. She can publish, she can write. Um, but there is a poem that I would like to read you in this um, called Small Days. Small Days. Remember Mars crab curry? Back down trench swimming? Catching shrimps to dry on the zinc rooftop against the blaze of mid-afternoon sun? Pa sop, sopping his soup of soft yam, edo, yellow plantain, duff, dasheen, Cassava and sweet potato boiled down with coconut milk and salt fish we called metaji. Remember Pa's old man smell? We smell sitting cross-legged, sniffing the coconut smell mixed in with his particular smell. We always known. Incense, herbs and oils from way back when Ma and Pa's grandma and grandpa used to pray to their own gods to beat back the rain and stop the curse of their dying out children. Remember Ma's outstretched arm stretching to welcome stray children not of her own belly, making us share our no-meat shine rice with those who beat us bad in school 
and down by the trench too, where we shouldn't walk too late in case the water people took to liking me. <laughs> like when little boy disappeared, and that was why they said water mama took to liking him. Pa and Ma's love was rainbows over the Atlantic we wished upon. It was sunshine after sweet rain that raised the gleam of each blade of grass, like the deep sleep seat blue wings on a floating palm fly. Their love was soft and sweet as spice mango we bought from the passing truck we chased for the taste of mango love. Remember Ma's musky smelling head tie, barely covering her silver strands, we took turns to comb and scratch whilst holding her weary head on our laps, brushing away the flies enchanted by the sweet coconut oil daubed in her hair. And Pa, never wrinkled, became more bronze, his eyes sparkled like pearls, as the serenity of wise living eased him into old age, until they left on separate ways, waves bound for the Atlantic, leaving us lonely for our small days. Thank you, Michelle. Well, that was supposed to be just a taste, because as I said, there's going to be the interactive session with authors next door, because we have quite a few other authors here today. Um, first and foremost, uh, the next session will be next door in the library, and that will be with Colin Babb, who wrote the book, They Gave the Crowd Plenty Fun. My name is Colin Babb, and thank you for giving me five to ten minutes to talk about my book, They Gave the Crowd Plenty Fun. And the reason I'm holding the mic is that I do a one-man show as part of my other life. And I tell a lot of funny stories and jokes. I wander around a bit because I can't keep still. And so that's why I've got the mic in my hands. And before I start, I just want to say thank you very much to uh, Mr. Arif Ali, who I believe is in the room somewhere. Um, he, <laughs> yes, I know, I'm just, just building him up. <laughs> I was kind of... I'm very, thanks, Ari, for supporting me and pulling the book out, um, and also doing the revised and updated edition, which is a lot better, in my opinion. I'm not going to read an extract from the book. I'm just going to talk a little bit about why I put the book together and what it means. Um, I think the main sales pitch about the book is that you don't have to be a cricket fan to like it. Uh, the book is called They Gave the Crowd Plenty Fun, and it's about West Indian cricket and its connection with the Caribbean community in Britain. So it's basically about the history of cricket and how it connects with the Caribbean community here. Uh, not specifically the Guyanese community, but of course the Guyanese community is part of the Caribbean community. Um, I actually wrote the book for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons is that I've always been interested in West Indies cricket. Um, and I've always been interested in the history of the Caribbean community in Britain. So I thought that was an ideal combination. Um, I've written in other people's books, so the idea of writing my own book was quite an adventure for me. And um, the sort of serious side of this relationship and the serious side of this book was formed when I did my MA in Caribbean Studies at Warwick University. Uh, one of my uh, advisors, I could say, was Professor David Dabberdeen, and he was um, quite encouraging in developing the idea for, for which t turned out to be the book. Um, I've got a photo in my hand. I'm holding the mic very steadily while I produce this. This is the cover of the book. And it's from 1963 when the West Indies won a match at the Oval and they beat England. And the person who scored the winning runs uh, was Basil Butcher. And I don't know if anybody here remembers Basil. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, there we are. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, I did a lot of research and interview, interviews for this book. Um, I spent a lot of time in Bridgetown Library in Barbados. Um, I also spent a lot of time in the British Library. And I interviewed quite a lot of cricketers and people who were connected with the game. And also, um, I was looking at the second and third generation aspect of this. So I spoke to people at like Ebony, Rainford, Brent, Alex Tudor, um, Gladstone Small, who our cricketers of Caribbean descent who all played for England. Part of the book was looking at why cricket isn't very important to the Caribbean now when compared with 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. Um, so that's an important part of what the book is all about. Um, also, I think in recent times, uh, a lot of the media attention has been focused on the 70s and the 80s, the Clive Lloyd, Clive Lloyd years and the Viv Richard years. But I think cricket 
and the way it connects with the Caribbean community in Britain has a much richer and longer history, and it's something that we should not ignore. We should not ignore the 1950 famous test match at Lord's Cricket, lovely cricket, Rabbit Inn and Valentine. We should not ignore the 1928 tour to England, where Derry Constantine was able to, through that tour, play for Nelson Cricket Club in Lancashire, uh, one of the first West Indians to play club cricket in this country. We should never ignore that. And of course the 1963 tour, a very important tour, because that was at the height of migration from the Caribbean to Britain. So the idea of West Indies coming here and winning 3-1 against England in 1963 was very important to a lot of Caribbean people here. So the focus on the book goes from the 1920s up to the present day. Also looks at the famous Black Rush series in 1984 when the West Indies won 5-0 here and also looks at the famous uh, Grovel tour of 1976 when Tony Gregg said a few things which uh, annoyed a lot of West Indian fans and players. Um, but interestingly enough, um, as part of my research for the book, I found out that Tony Gregg was in, in fact very, uh, very much important in recruiting West Indian players to play for the Packer series, World Series Cricket, which in turn helped the West Indian players uh, collectively earn more money from the West Indian Cricket Board. Uh, so in a way, Tony Gregg uh, indirectly helped West Indies cricket, which is something I, I didn't discover until I did the research for the book. Um, it was very important for me to write this book because um, I feel that the, the relationship between the West Indies cricket and the community here is dying, which is very unfortunate. And there are many reasons for that. And it's not just to do with the West Indies uh, in the last 15, 20, 25 years having a bad run of results. I don't think that's it. I think the community here has changed. Um, second, third and fourth generation people of Caribbean descent. I don't think have that connection with the Caribbean that maybe people who migrated here in the 50s and 60s did and their immediate descendants. I remember when I was growing up here in the 70s, when the West Indies came on tour, it was a massive event. Even if you were not a cricket fan, it was very important to you. But now that is no longer the case. Um, also, if you're born in this country and your mother's got Caribbean connections, it's more likely. I meet so many people now who were born here, but it's their grandparents, even great-grandparents who are from the Caribbean. So that connection with the Caribbean is beginning to disappear. And obviously, there's obviously the competitive forces of football and basketball and other sports which, which people want to participate in. And um, another less optimistic uh, uh, statement I'd like to make is the fact that the majority of people of Caribbean descent in this country go to state schools which do not play cricket. So the participation is, is beginning to decrease. Now, when I went to my schools, all state schools in the 70s, we all played cricket, but there again, all the playing fields have disappeared and all the fundings have disappeared. You can blame Margaret Thatcher for that, I don't know. But, uh, you know, that's just what's been, that's what is going on. Um, another thing I, I'd like to talk about was why the West Indies team was important to me. It was A lot of it was down to the fact that when I was growing up in England, there, there weren't that many... Um, obvious uh, black personalities on television, um, including Caribbean personalities. I remember a guy called Cliff Hall, who was one of the few Caribbean people I used to see on TV regularly because he was a member of a band called The Spinners. Did anybody remember The Spinners? Yeah. At least have a show on Saturday night. When Cliff Hall came on, it was quite an exciting moment, you know. <laughs> and I always remember when I was younger, uh, whenever we'd watch a program like Zen Cars. Anybody remember Zen Cars? Yes. Programs like that. You know, there'd be a black guy sitting in the cafe and we'd shout, there's a black man on the telly! <laughs> and everybody would come from like all corners of the flat to try and watch. By the time they got there, this black guy disappeared. <laughs> and then we'd watch the credits to see what surname he had, you know, to see if he, where he's from. So if he was shilling for these, a Dominican, right? Mm -hmm. well, so we'd always, and it'd be a very exciting moment. I can, I can actually see my mother now calling her Jamaican friend to tell you there was a black person on the TV, on the telephone. You know, it was such an exciting moment. So when the West Indies came here, you know, you had the West Indian team beating England, it gave you a real sense of visible, visible focus. It was so important. And you didn't have to be a cricket fan to appreciate that. Uh, my mother is not a cricket fan, but for her, when the West Indies won, it was a very important moment. So all these are symbolic things. Uh, and so that's what the, what the book is about. And it's about my life growing up in this country as a second generation West Indian child, how cricket was important to me. And there's lots of humor involved as well. It's not all about the political and social and cultural side of it. There's a lot of humorous anecdotes about growing up in Britain around that time. 
and I was having a chat in the room next door just now. Uh, lots of migration stories, which you always hear when you come to these events. I came here in 1961, and I came here in 1962, and you know all the usual stories. My mum used to used to say, and you know, I've never seen snow, and I remember it was so foggy, and then he fell over, and you know all the stories that you hear. And um, I, my memories are embedded in the 70s, but uh, one of the things that cricket gave me was a sense of a pan-Caribbean self, because I grew up with two very uh, dominant, strong. Guyanese women, my mother and my grandmother who were Guyanese in my house, on my flat in South London. And I always felt, when I was growing up, I always felt Guyanese. I didn't really feel West Indian. But what the West Indian team gave me was a sense that we're all in it together. We're all part of a pan-Caribbean family. Um, and I supported the team regardless of whether they were Guyanese or Bajans or Trinidadian solutions. It didn't matter to me. Um, and just to finish, it was very, very noticeable when the West Indies won the 2020 World Cup recently, the men and the women, um, it suddenly struck me this morning that there wasn't a Guyanese player in that team. Not one. And to me, that wasn't really important. And that shows what cricket does. It, it doesn't matter where you're from in the Caribbean. When the cricket is on, generally, that's when all the divisions between the different islands, uh, nationalities, all the class and race barriers tend to get broken down generally when that cricket matches on. And that's why the West Indies team is still important, despite the fact that results and performances have been poor. So um, that's it.